We've come now to the amazing book of another amazing prophet. Of course, all of God's prophets are amazing, but uh, each one has some particular things that we can admire and be uh, completely uh, uh, admiring how God works through different people in different ways and in different circumstances. We covered the book of Ezekiel last year and you realize that Ezekiel was in a very specific uh, time uh, of, his, of his life when God revealed to him the coming uh, captivity and the downfall of the house of Israel. And now, with the book of Jeremiah, with the book of Jeremiah, God actually warned the ancient, the Old Testament Jewish society of the consequences of its sins. Now, of course, in order to understand any prophet, including the book, including Jeremiah, we need to know the background, and uh, we need to have some comments, introductory comments to that book. Now, Jeremiah has been inspiration to God's people for millennia. He was unique in that he was around for the day after the fall of the kingdom of Judah. So he survived the fall of the kingdom of Judah and then he carried out his mission further because he had very important task given to him by God. Now some think of him as the prophet of doom. Uh, the term Jeremiah is one who gives a lament or bad news and therefore it is traditionally understood that he is the author of the book of Lamentations. Now here is the organization of the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah can be actually broken down to about seven, seven areas. Uh, it is not chronological, so that might be puzzling. So we can kind of break it up into sections dealing with various subjects rather than chronological order. So in the first section, it's chapters 1 through 20. It speaks about a couple of kings. One is Josiah and the other one is Joachim, his successor. The second section is chapters 21 through 35. It speaks of the king Jehoiakim and king Zedekiah, the last Jewish king. The third section is chapter 36 through 44. It's a historical narrative. Then the fourth section is actually one chapter, chapter 45. That chapter is referenced to Baruch. Baruch was his secretary. Area or section number five will be chapters 46 through 49. It is actually the prophecy of neighboring peoples, neighboring peoples around the country of Judea, the ancient Judea. Section six is chapters 50 and 51. Is description of Babylon which parallels Revelation chapter 18 because as you know we have the modern Babylon spiritual Babylon that is present in our time just like the ancient Babylon was ruling over the peoples and nations in its in the ancient Old Testament times and finally chapter 55 would be uh, sorry 52 that is chapter 52 would be a historical appendix that's, that's the seventh and the last section of the book of Jeremiah so again the book of Jeremiah is not chronological, so we can break it up only into the sections dealing with various subjects. Now, by the time that the book of Jeremiah was being written, the, the house of Israel was taken into captivity. In fact, it was taken into captivity before the birthright blessings were fulfilled. So their birthright blessings were not fulfilled in the, while they were dwelling in the Holy Land. Their uh, birthright blessings were fulfilled just after they were scattered and uh, found their new dwellings. In this, at the same time, Judah, the kingdom of Judah, remained in the promised land, and there was indeed a priesthood line from Judah. It was the tribe of Levi, descendants of Aaron, and there was also monarchy there coming from the line of David. Jeremiah interacted with royalty of Judah as a priest. You see, he had both aspects in his life. He was a priest and he was also a prophet. In Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 1, if you read that verse, it shows us the family line of Jeremiah. So we see in this verse that he is a son of Hilkiah, who was not the high priest. This prophet, you see, had an important role in dealing with monarchy. Also, Jeremiah ties in with commission. In chapter 1 verse 10, we read that his commission was to lift up, to throw down, and also to lift up, uh, to build, and to plant. So, for, from what we know about the history of Jeremiah, we know that he was able to go to Ireland and take a remnant of David's royal line following the mass slaughter of Jewish aristocracy by the Babylonians. Now, the remnant of that royal line married into another branch of the house of David and ruled in Israel, in scattered Israel, not anymore in Judah. And after the house of Israel was exiled from the promised land, it never had a ruler from David over it. 
But now the line of David was ruling over a part of Israel, over the British Isles, that is. It was ruling, you see, in the British Isles again, which is populated. The Isles are populated by descendants of so-called lost tribes of Israel. There are also several possible meanings of Jeremiah's name. One possible meaning is the eternal will lift up rise. The other one is the eternal is exalted. The third possibility is the eternal hurls or the eternal throws. The fourth one is the eternal establishes. And the fifth one, the eternal loses. Loses, which is reference to his birth, because according to Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, he was a prophet before born. You see, Paul, Jesus, and John the Baptist were also determined for the ministry before they were born. We also have tradition of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, we find this tradition not in the canonized books, but in the historical books of the Bible, which are not canonized, but nevertheless, they're historically accurate. In 2 Maccabees, chapter 2, verse 1 through 9, you'll find, brethren, account of the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem at this time. Now, what was this time? Well, this time was the intertestament time, we might call it that way. Intertestament between the two testaments. Now, tradition is that Jeremiah went and found the ark and blocked up the area where he hid the ark. And in, it is the same area where Moses died. In other words, no one knows where, because no one knows where Moses was buried. Now, what was Jeremiah like? Well, you know, he had internal strength to oppose those around him and he faced much persecution. Really, a person, when you read about the persecution that he endured, one really has to have a character, strong character, to endure being opposed by everyone, by your monarch, by your aristocracy, by the priesthood, by the prophets, false prophets, that is, all, all around him. So, other than Baruch, and later, other than Zedekiah's daughter, Jeremiah was much hated and persecuted by the society around him. In Jeremiah chapter 1, in verse 18, we'll see that he was the kind of person God said Jeremiah had to be. He had to prophesy to leaders, priests, and the general public. In chapter 15 and verse 20, he came close to being martyred. He was almost martyred. And when Judah went into captivity, he was treated with a great respect by his enemies. You know, what an irony. But we know from both the Old and the New Testament what is the uh, circumstances in which a prophet can, may, or will be living? In Matthew thirteen fifty seven, it says a prophet is not without honor, except in his own land. In Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 6, we read that his family, we will be reading that his family rejected him. In chapter 38, verse 6, we will be reading that he was imprisoned by his government. In chapter 11, verse 21, we will be reading that his own hometown sought his life. So you see, what a level of persecution, what a, a proportions of the persecution that engulfed Jeremiah. Really, he had to really be close to God and endure all of that. And he only certainly was able to endure it because of his close relationship with the Eternal. Now, we know from Numbers chapter, chapter 6 that it was priest's job to pray for congregation to pray and to bless the congregation. A priest was a bridge from the people to God. He was a type of Christ, and Jeremiah actually did it. So you see, he had a priestly function. He also had the function of being a prophet. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1, and also in Lamentation chapter 3, verse 1, Jeremiah gets indeed very personal. He comments on disaster, and he gives us his personal reaction to it. You might remember here how much he was weeping over the fate of his people, the kingdom of Judah. You might also remember his lamentations in which he laments all the destruction that happened to Jerusalem and to the country of Judea. So he was a very emotional person, you might say, but he was also a patriotic person because he was a great patriot, even though that the country of Judah, the kingdom of Judah, was in such a sad spiritual state of, of, of being. Jeremiah, nevertheless, still cried and lamented over the destruction that befell his own people. Uh, at times, it all seemed bad to Jeremiah, like in chapter 15, verse 10, he expresses that kind of despair. In chapter 20, verses 14 through 18, we will be reading about an emotion of Jeremiah because he was upset with what was going on. But also in chapter 7 and verse 16, 
We will be reading that God said to Jeremiah not to pray or intercede for people of Judah because there is no other way to make people learn except through their punishment. And the same instruction from God we find two more times in Jeremiah in chapters 11 and chapter 14. Chapter 11 verse 14 and chapter 14 verse 11. Now also in Jeremiah chapter 18 verse 20, Jeremiah indeed in his despair he asked God to bring punishment on those who persecuted him. Now of course you and I need to know the time setting of the book because that also tells us something about the, uh, its meaning and the, uh, tells us about the context in which we read certain prophecies. Now the time setting is this one. Uh, in chapter 1 verses 2 and 3 it gives us reign of kings ruling throughout the book. Then also in chapter 1 and verse 5, it tells us of a spe special calling and commission that Jeremiah had. In chapter 25 verse 3, we have another historical time setting. You see, Jeremiah was born around 645 before Christ, towards the end of Manasseh's reign. You might remember the kind of ruler that Manasseh was. I think when you read uh, all the things about what he did in the, in, the, in the kingdom of Judah, it makes your stomach churn and turn. It is such a horror. It's so much occultism. It's so, it's so much heathenism. It is so anti-God that one just wonders, uh, could, it, could there be any great, greater evil that befell the house of Judah? Nevertheless, so towards the end of Manasseh's reign, Jeremiah was born. And he was called in 1627 before Christ, in the 13th year of Josiah's reign. You probably know that Josiah was actually the last righteous Jewish king. The last tzaddik or righteous king on the throne of David. And Jeremiah's ministry extends approximately half a century, 50 years, so throughout 580s because he was the one who witnessed the fall of Jerusalem, and then he had to replace the throne of David from the Holy Land into the scattered Israel. So he approximately served the house of Judah, and we can say also the house of Israel, for 50 years. Now Baruch, the scribe, was Jeremiah's assistant, and Judah repented during this time, during the time of Josiah. Josiah reformed uh, relig uh, religion, and reformed the worship that Judah was given over to, and he basically destroyed all the legacy of his ancestor Manasseh. So therefore, Jeremiah might, he may have had part in this restoration of the true worship of God. Also at this time, there were a couple of other prophets that were prophesying. One was uh, the lady named Hulda, Hilda, and Zephaniah, the prophet Zephaniah, was also prophesying at this time. Also, Ezekiel and David, they were younger com contemporaries of Jeremiah. Because we see that from the Bible. For example, in Daniel, chapter 9, verse 2, we can see that Jeremiah had influence on Daniel. Because that verse refers to Jeremiah and the 70 years of the captivity of Judah in Babylon. Also, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 25, and verse 12, we have a 70-year period prophesied of Babylonian control. And that really lasted from 609 until 539 before Christ, when under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah, the remnant of Judah did you know, return to its promised land to restore the Judah and Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem. And also 70 years are mentioned, not only in Daniel, but Daniel read it from the book of Jeremiah. It's re re mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 10. So Jeremiah obviously, brethren, had influence on others. He influenced others. In chapter 31 of his book, in verses 29 and 30, we see that each person is being judged. Now, Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 2 says the same as all that we have just read so far, which also, you know, means that Jeremiah as well influenced Ezekiel. Now, again, we mentioned that Jeremiah obviously most likely participated in the reform of religion in the house of Judah. Of, co of course, that, was be, uh, that would be going on during the reign of the king Josiah. Josiah was a humble, a very righteous king, the last one on the, on the throne of David. Uh, that reform is described in 2 Kings in chapter 23. So I'm just giving you all these references. I'm giving you the background to the book. And uh, later on, we'll be dealing with each chapter respectively. We'll be reading chapter by chapter 
of the book of Jeremiah and we'll be analyzing uh, all the important things that God did through Jeremiah in his own time. So uh, in 2 Kings chapter 23 we read about Josiah and how he reformed the evil religion that was, uh, that was entrenched in the house of Judah in the minds of people, in their hearts and in their customs. We'll be reading later in chapter 7 how uh, fathers gather the wood and how women make dough for the queen of heaven and how children are there to help them in all of that. In chapter 10 we read about the worship of the trees, the exact equivalent to Christmas trees and in some parts of the world New Year, New Year trees because in my country for example uh, what is Christmas trees was uh, it used to be New Year's trees. And nowadays, because Christmas comes later than December 25, after the January the 1st, nowadays people actually use the trees for both the New Year, Roman New Year, and Christmas, Orthodox Christmas time. Now, Jer uh, Josiah, as you know, died. He died in a battle. He was indeed a righteous ruler who went up against Pharaoh, Neho, and that battle is mentioned in Second Chronicles chapter 35, verses 22 through 24. And Jeremiah, of course, that's why we have, among other things, lamentation. He lamented for Josiah, and he also organized mourning for Josiah, and he told people of the disaster to come. Disaster was the mighty Babylonian empire, which by that time rose to the heights of its power. And it was basically knocking on the door of Judah, just about to conquer the land of Judah and destroy Jerusalem. However, we'll be seeing in the book of Jeremiah, brethren, that people did not even pay any attention. They were just sitting around listening to the false prophets who were telling them, Oh, don't worry. Safety, safety, peace and peace. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. So in Lamentation chapter 4 and verse 20, uh, we might fi may find a reference actually to King Josiah, the last righteous king on the throne of David in the Holy Land. In Second Chronicles chapter 36, in verses 20 and 21, there is a warning and uh, to Judah of its final fall. Who gave the warning? Of course, the prophet Jeremiah, because his commission was to warn the complete Jewish society, the upper echelons of the society, the common people of the coming destruction coming from the hands of the Babylonians. Now, of course, in his, uh, during his ministry, we had several kings. Uh, the first one after Josiah was King Jehoahaz. He was taken into captivity after a short period of reign, only three months. Then came King Jehoahim, who displaced him within days, and he was placed on the throne by the, uh, uh, by the Egyptian pharaoh. And he was uh, a friend to Egyptian pharaoh. So the house of Judah, you see, brethren, was because of the imminent danger from the Babylonians, the house of Judah, instead of relying on God for protection, the house of Judah actually relied upon its ally, Egypt, for protection against the Babylonians. And that's what the modern house of Israel, uh, not only the Jewish, when I say the modern house of Israel, I mean the Israelitish countries, including America, Canada, uh, 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 including New, New Zealand and the British Isles and Australia. So the modern Israelites, as well as the state of Israel, the Jewish state of Israel, they all actually rely upon their allies for protection, not to God. Now, <coughs> after Jehoiakim, came King Jehoiakim. He reigned for 18, uh, sorry, he reigned for 11 years, that is, and he became a vassal king to Babylonians, because by the time, Babylonian Empire became the mightiest in the world, so it was, uh, it subdued basically this king and made him a vassal king. Then, of course, he didn't want to be vassal anymore, so he rebelled and he wanted to form an alliance with Egypt and the results were disastrous, totally disastrous. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8 explains Jeremiah well because we'll be finding the reference to the mind, to the heart in the book of Jeremiah. So we can find the elements of the new covenant, the elements of the new covenant we find all the, in the old. You know, in the old the new is found and in the new the old is explained. So uh, it, is, uh, it is again shows us the harmony of the Bible, shows us the unity of the Bible, and shows us the unity of the revelation that God gave to us through His Holy Word. Now, Jehoiakim, he came back and he reigned for three months, and then he was taken captive. While the king Zedekiah, the last king on the throne of David in the Promised Land, he ruled for 11 years. He was taken 
into captive by the Babylonians. He was the last king of Judah and he went and he died also into captivity. In Jeremiah, however, you know, however, all of these tragedies that have befallen the, the, the house of Judah, in Jeremiah chapter 52, we find that that chapter ends on a positive note. So, you know, we, regardless of all the horrible things that are coming again, because the Bible repeats, the history repeats itself, and the Bible, the Bible has a dual prophecies, what happened once in the past will happen again in the future, but this time with more intensity. Nevertheless, uh, we have in the end a positive note. Because, you know, Jeremiah chapter 52 summarizes, summarizes the destiny of Jerusalem, captivity. Then in verse 32, we see a sign that God would deal kindly with Judah. And this took place in 561 before Christ when Jehoiakim was brought out of prison. So that was the uh, forerunner of the kindness that God is going to show to Judah when their Messiah and our Messiah, Jesus Christ, comes back. Now Jeremiah is reputedly reputedly author of Kings, the book of Kings. So if you wondered who wrote the book of Kings, it would be the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, if you wonder who wrote the Chronicles that were also uh, basically uh, with the same account but with some uh, more details, Chronicles written according to tradition by Ezra. Ezra, who was, the, uh, uh, who was so righteous that in the Jewish tradition, it is said that if Moses did not give the Ten Commandments and the Pentateuch to the Israelites, that would be uh, Ezra, the prophet Ezra, and the scribe Ezra and the priest Ezra. So Jeremiah reputedly wrote Kings, and Ezra wrote the, the, the Chronicles, and Jeremiah, you see, is the prophet of the captivity, because he went through all of that process, he survived that captivity, and then later he had to flee from the uh, Middle East to flee to the British Isles. Uh, that's an amazing, an amazing, an amazing uh, commission that he fulfilled was to pluck up, you know, the throne of David from one location and replace it and relocate it to another geographic location. So he is the prophet of captivity. He was, brethren, permitted to stay back in Judea after the, all of the house of Judah went to Babylon. So he was permitted to stay. Only the poor and elderly and, you know, Jeremiah were left in Judea. The rest were taken captive to, in, in Babylon. You may wonder why all these, you know, elderly poor. Well, those are the ones who could not really organize any mutiny. They were not <laughs> able to really uh, make an uprise and, and, and you know, uh, rebel against the Babylonian power. So the Babylonians thought, well, just leave them in the land. At least the land will not be completely desolate and there will be somebody to till the land, somebody to pay the taxes and so on. So Jeremiah was left with those people. The rest were taken captive in Babylon and Jeremiah also prophesied good things about Babylon. And in fact, if you remember, his uh, advice to his kinsmen was just be calm, pay taxes, you know, be obedient, do not rebel and it will be well with you in Babylon. And one remnant, a remnant of you will return to the Holy Land. So Jeremiah's, you know, Jeremiah's calling from God is quite amazing. We'll be reading that in the in the book itself, but I'm just going to summarize it in this introduction. You know, uh, because he got his calling as a young man. Some of you who are listening to that, you're young people, you might say, "Oh, but we are so young, we haven't lived our lives yet." What does it mean to live your life to, your, to its fullest? What do you want? Do you want to be sinning in your life to the fullest and bring all kinds of consequences of sin and then say, oh, let me now dedicate myself to God? Well, you know what? There is one truth that you need to know. God does forgive sin, but he does not remove the consequences of sin. And the consequences could be, you know, unwanted children. Consequences could be all kinds of health issues. Consequences could be, you name it. And Jeremiah was young. He was basically a teenager. Uh, some commentators feel that he was called at age 14. Now, of course, this is doubtful, but he mostly, most likely started his ministry in his teens. So if you're a teenager and you're being called by God, it's a great privilege and honor. God wants to spare you from making terrible mistakes in your life. And by sparing you, he's showing you great mercy. And the less you have, the, uh, you know, the less you have of problems and consequences of sin, the better it is to conquer your human nature. The better it is to be close to God and inherit eternal life. In Jeremiah chapter one verse five, Jeremiah was called before his birth. Now notice how important that is. He was called before his birth, and he was prepared for the job in advance. 
Now, the only other two that we read about who were prepared in advance before they were formed in the wombs of their mothers is Jesus Christ and John the Baptist. Paul also is hinted at, but it is not so stated in the Bible as the first three are. John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and Jeremiah. In verse 6, you will read that anyone under 20 is considered a child. 20 is the age of accountability. At least that was the case in the past. I know it's 21, I think, in some of the American states. Here in Europe, generally, it is 18. But anyway, 20, anybody under 20 would be considered a child. So Jeremiah was likely 17 or 18 years old when he was called. And you see, the thing is that he had a willing attitude to serve, an attitude God could use. In verse 10, what Jeremiah was commissioned to do was remove daughters of the last Jewish king, Zedekiah, to Egypt, and then remove them to Ireland. And we find almost two 19-year time cycles in Jeremiah's ministry, which is also very significant. Jeremiah was sent to prophesy to Judah and to prophesy about a future captivity of Judah as well. In verse 18, uh, sorry, verse before 18, let's see, verse 11 in chapter 1. We're still speaking about the chapter 1 because we have the good introduction to his commission and what was the uh, task God had given him. In verse 11, we have an analogy of almond tree. Now, why almond? Because it's hastening tree. You see, almonds bloom in January and give fruit in March. Most fruit trees start to flower in March and produce fruit in August. And all almond tree is called the hastening tree. In verse 13, there is an interesting analogy also. It's seething pot. Seething pot actually means water. So we'll be reading that and we'll be analyzing that and interpreting that as we go along. In verse 14, we find that from north would God bring forth captivity. Now, it's easier to come from the north than to the east anyway. And in verse 15, after Hezekiah came, the king Manasseh, the horrible king Manasseh, he was as bad as all the other apostate kings. And even though the king Josiah made some reforms in Judah, the Jews, again, brethren, went back into idolatry. And we will be reading that all throughout the book of Jeremiah. And if you want to mark your Bible, you will see how saturated the book of Jeremiah is with condemnation of the sun worship. I'm especially reminded of the danger of worshiping the sun with the last, last night, it was the Friday evening, it was Friday night, but of course it was Shabbat, it was the Sabbath, however, the people around us celebrated the Roman New Year with all kinds of fireworks and firecrackers and things that uh, just upset the normal mind, upset all the, all the pets around in our houses, and uh, they just celebrate as if there is anything to be celebrated. I, I, at one point, was on the verge of crying. I was looking at all of those fireworks around the city because I have a very good view from my balcony, so I could well see... Uh, you know, the, 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 the amount of the fireworks around, I wanted to cry, wondering, what is this, what is that these people are celebrating? I'm like, if Jesus Christ was coming back today, or last night, would they be so joyous and celebrating? Obviously not. We know from the Bible that they will not be happy with Jesus Christ returning. Plus, we have the Energy crisis in Europe these days. Inflation is high. It's winter time. I'm wondering what are these people celebrating, you know. But anyway, sun worship. That was the problem of the house of Israel. That's the problem of the house of Judah in Old Testament. But brethren, that's exactly the same terrible problem of the house of Israel in our times. And the house of Judah, of course, included. Sun worship. If you were to mark your Bible, you'll be finding sun all over the place. All over the place in your Bible. Sun, sun. We'll, fee, we'll see that in the, book of, in the book of Jeremiah. We saw also that in the book of Ezekiel, when people were just worshipping all kinds of things. And then the, 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 the pinnacle of their apostasy from God was that they were turned with their faces toward the east, worshipping the rising sun. And we see here, We'll be seeing in the book of Jeremiah that the house of Judah did exactly the same and even worse. And the problem was sun, sun-centered worship, sun-centered worship. So again, regardless of uh, uh, Josiah's reforms, the Jews again went back into idolatry. As soon as Josiah died, the nation went back into idolatry and God was indeed very displeased with that. And uh, of course, there is one analogy as my last comment in this introduction, there is an analogy of love for people because there is a marriage relationship. 
you know, they were led to the promised land. God was their husband, they were the bride, they were led to the paradise, or you might say to the kingdom of God, which was the promised land, and there is an analogy of love for people. So here we have, again, a wonderful prophet before us that we'll be analyzing in the weeks to come. We have a prophet who was very emotional, we have a prophet who was a true patriot, we, have, we had the prophet who was of such a strong character that he had to endure uh, the persecution by his family, by his government, by his kinsmen, by his hometown. And here we have the wonderful book recorded for us today, brethren, to once again remind us how the history is going to be repeating itself because the same thing that happened to the ancient house of Judah is exactly going to happen to the modern house of Judah and the modern house of Israel as well.